I'm a feminist, but tonight backstage, I argued quite hard with my co-host Grace Petrie that I was in some ways more marginalised than she was because it costs so much more to be femme than to be butch. (laughs) But so much more, but so much more. Grace's girlfriend and I explained to her at length, against her will, the, the, the concept of the fem tax, which she claimed sounded like a tampon. I mean, we acknowledge the ways in which she is marginalised, but can't, it just costs so much, takes so much time. Uh. But also, I mean, I do get 100% of my clothes from the children's department, so um, <laughs> I will concede that I spend quite a lot less I think, on this. <laughs> would we call it an aesthetic? I don't know. I, um, would, I would, I would. would. Is it my turn? It is your turn. So I'm a feminist, but I had um, a massage last week. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was on tour in Australia. I've been carrying my guitar around on my back and my muscles were, my back was, had a really terrible back. So I went for this massage and it was a deep tissue massage. Mm. And it was this really formidable massage therapist, like in her 60s, with just these really incredibly strong hands and she was just fucking going to town. Like, you know, really pulverizing my, my entire back to the point where I was like clinging on to the table, like white knuckling it, just thinking, God, when is this going to be over? And, and after about 12 minutes, she said, how's that pressure? And I said, it's perfect. <laughs> That's the word that I use. Perfect. It's wow. Perfect. Did it fix the back in any way? Oh, it's a lot worse. (laughs) I'm a feminist, but backstage, when complaining about the costs of femme gender expression to Grace Petrie, in my defence, I tried to get academic and at one point just said, because of the implications of hegemony, blah, 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 blah. And Grace and Molly looked at me and went, blah, 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 blah. And I went, blah, 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 blah. I think you know what I mean. Implications of hegemony. Blah, 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 blah. blah. Yeah, it was a real feminist moment. It was a very <laughs> yeah, bastion of, uh, of the philosophy for you there, Deb. Um, uh, so I'm a feminist, but um, uh, last week I was reading... Uh, an article about a woman who decided to have a, throw her daughter a first period party, right? This is a new thing. Uh, And she, yeah, and so she, yeah. And she, and it's quite, no, it's quite a growing thing. This is in America, this woman, uh, and it was her daughter had her first period. And so she said, we want to celebrate your entering womanhood and held this party and baked her a cake for it. And I read that and I thought, fuck off! (laughs) Fuck off! Get fucked! Get fucked! Right? Right? Get fucked! Like, honestly, when I, when I was a kid and my mother explained to me what periods were, right, and what happens, right? Um, sorry if any of you don't know, but it's not good. Um, and um, my mum explained to me what was going to happen and I, and I remember being about, you know, six or seven or something, having this explained to me what was going to happen and I was like, are you fucking kidding are you serious? Mm. You, that's, that sounds like the worst thing in the world. Mm. But now, you know, I'm 35, I've been menstruating for like 20 years, and actually, I was spot on, wasn't I? Fucking yeah. hell. <laughs> I was bang on the money. It's true. A party does seem like... <laughs> an, yeah. I mean, maybe it's to try and counteract it. There are various traditions around the world for what happens, but a party does seem... <laughs> It seems a very contemporary response, doesn't it? It's sort of like, uh, yeah. No. yeah. I remember the girls talking about it at school and saying, um, blood is just going to start rushing out of your legs, between your legs out and front of, your of everyone. Legs. Between your legs and front <laughs> of everyone. Fucking hell, I've been doing it wrong. <laughs> but they just said, it can happen any time. It's going to be like a waterfall. And yeah. I didn't stop to question, why did I not see this happening to mm. women? Um, but yeah. Well, I, I was that. so Catholic, I, a Catholic school, so similar. I was remember, I remember... Because you learn about, we well, don't learn, but you get taught about the Virgin Mary, right? From really, really, really young. No, no shade on Catholics. But uh, they were, well, some. Um, <laughs> some, but for the right reasons. Um, <laughs> but, 
And at primary school, they were just going on about what that meant is that she just got pregnant, right? She just got pregnant. They don't really go into what it means to be a virgin, but it's just like she got pregnant. And I remember being like five years old and being like, I think I, I'm going to get pregnant at any point. <laughs> it's just going to happen. Oh my God, you thought yeah. you were going to be the Virgin Mary? Yeah, That's know. quite main character syndrome of you, if you don't mind me saying. <laughs> you just assumed that God was going to pop a baby no, in you. I just thought... You were going to be the mother of the second I, coming. I just thought it could happen to anyone. I was like, you know what I mean? And when, I, when people talked about trying for a baby, I, I thought that meant praying really hard. Um, it's like they've been oh, really see. trying. They've been in there every so fucking you, day, trying so and trying and trying. extrapolated from the story of the Virgin Mary that all babies were just surprise presents yeah. from God. Yeah. And they would just be thrust upon you at a time that was neither convenient for you. Yeah. Nor and I remember, I remember being welcome. like, fucking hell, I hope it doesn't happen this year. I got my sats. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's too good. It's too good. Oh, God. I'm a feminist. Um, but backstage... Grace Petrie and Molly Naylor offered to show me a game they play called Whose Jizz Is It Anyway? And I discovered I'm a lot less sex positive than I've claimed. <laughs> or indeed advertised. I'm not sex positive at all. They were just like, no, it's really fun. We'll play it on stage. I was like, we won't. <laughs> Whose jizz is it anyway? But anyway, I think we, we will. will. We, we might, we might. If the audience bay for it, who wants to see Whose Jizz Is It Anyway? Right. Who would rather not see that? Yes! Just, yeah, you're in the minority. Somebody's sorry. very enthusiastic about not seeing it, but... Uh... Yeah. Okay, well, we'll see how we go. We'll see how we go. Live from Soho Theatre in London, the Sponsored Daily Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Neville Francis White, guest co-host, the fabulous Grace Petrie, and our very special guest, Molly Nair. Theatre on a Saturday night for the Guilty Feminist. Yeah! So delighted you've come. It's so lovely to be back out with real people in real life and not on screens and things, isn't it? I've still not got over it. I'm still excited that I can touch you. I don't. Do I? I, I sorry, I just. I, I just want to say she put her hand out and that implied consent. I'm not just going around stroking and swiping people as much as I want to. I want to, but I hold myself back because I'm a feminist and I understand the importance of consent. But can I lick you? She, she just went, no. But then someone over here went, yes. So that's nice. Now I've got options. Uh, uh, so early in the night. So, so lovely. So, so lovely. Uh, just give us a cheer if you listen to The Guilty Feminist. Woo! Give us a cheer if you don't know what you're at. Woo! Okay. All right. More people than normal. Do you know that it's a podcast? Uh, who didn't know it was a podcast? Not when we booked it. Not when we booked it. <laughs> I don't want to assume your gender. Uh, is it okay to call you sir? Or this one booked it. The, she said we're going to the theatre. I said great, let's go. What she's brought you to, sir, is a feminist rally. It's not theatre. It's not the theatre, sir. It's not the theatre. It's not the theatre. She's misled you, and she sat you in the middle of a row where you cannot escape. There's no aisle for days on either side. And if the feminists on either side of this man could just put their legs out, <laughs> pen him in. She's brought him for a reason. I don't know her, but I know she's brought him for a reason. Because you just, there's no need to lie if he would have come willingly. But listen, desperate times, desperate measures, gang. Come on, we've been waiting for the patriarchy to change in a nice, slow, reasonable fashion for fucking thousands of years. They've not bothered. They've not even made an attempt. So now we have to use what we have to use, sir. Uh, and if that includes comedy and brute force in a delicious cocktail, mm -mm, then it does. Do you, would you call yourself a feminist, sir? I've come to find out. Oh, you've come to find out? Okay, well, he's, he's, he's still talking, but we can't hear what he's saying now because the rabble, the rabble has been excited. I've come to find out. It's what I find fascinating, and I've said it before, but it, it's the only thing I can think of these situations is, if I were to have accidentally gone to a men's rights activist rally, <laughs> being 
being told it was the, the theatre and then I was like, oh, I thought this was a play about, oh, I'm actually at one, okay. <laughs> Firstly, I would stay very quiet and draw no attention to myself. <laughs> I would not shout out and, and, and get ahead of it heckling. But if then, if I had accidentally drawn attention to myself and now amongst all of these men's rights activists, I was the solo feminist thinking, oh, fuck. And somebody pointed to me from the stage and clearly in a position of power in some way or another, said to me, and are you a men's rights activist? I'm a feminist, but I would go, yes, very much. I'm very... <laughs> very keen on the, on the men and the rights and the activism for that. So that's in fact, I've come to learn more because I feel I need more tools in my box for the rights, for the activists, for the rights of the M's, the R's, the, yes, the A's and the, ooh. Are there any incels here? Because I, I hate the fact that it's involuntary for you. Um, it's a dark joke, isn't it? I'm sorry, I take it back. I retract it. Um, but you've come, you've come to find out, what's your name? Christian. Why are you laughing? I need to know precisely why you found that funny. Because it was Christian. Oh, and you, and you said, oh God. Yeah, okay, I see. It's an ecclesiastical pun. That's, that's what happened there. That's what happened there. Um... Christian, you, is it your wife who brought you? I don't mean to make assumptions. Yep. But I knew it was. <laughs> Sometimes assumptions are right, aren't they? Sometimes. It's not a third hinge date, is it? <laughs> I'll tell you exactly who brings people to my show on a, on a third hinge date. Men. <laughs> that happens all the fucking time. Happens all the fucking time. A man, a man, a man who has been on two very pleasant dates that have ended with an enjoyable kiss. <laughs> Says, I'll plan the next date. It'll be something really fun, really fun. Really, really fun, be really fun, really fun. And then he brings her to a show called The Guilty Feminist. And she laughs loads and he goes, I love this show <laughs> about feminism. So I'm just so, all I care about is equal rights for women. You're very safe. You're very safe to touch it. Because um, it loves equal rights too. It loves... It'll stand up and salute for feminism if you look at it right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, yeah. I have got more men in this town laid than virtually anyone else. Because you can see why. I mean, this show is a sort of... I don't know, it feels like a, a good aphrodisiac, do you know what I mean? People are laughing, they're laughing along, they're having a good time, it's fun. We all come together to be right here, we enjoy how right we are, we leave. We go, that was a lovely evening being right with other people who agreed I was right. It's a tough environment out there. You've spent all day on Twitter, you didn't feel right there very much, did you? You did feel right, you felt right but wounded, right but argumentative, right, but you had to defend yourself. Here, you can just be right and relax. Relax in your rightness, Christian. I mean, not you, not you actually, but your wife can. And what's Christian's wife's name? I'm sure she doesn't identify as Christian's wife. She's a feminist. Lola, Lola. Do you listen to the guilty feminist, Lola? No, I found it just by mistake. You found it by mistake. <laughs> Lola has. Lola has also come on holiday by mistake. Uh, Lola. But would you, what drew you here? What drew you to it? Because you must have, did you think it was a play? We had, we had about 25 people here last night who thought it was a play. <laughs> to the extent where we had to do a short play at the end. <laughs> it was the play that we, we did the play we thought they'd come to see called <laughs> The Guilty Family. It was just one scene. It was very poor. Um, <laughs> can I ask you, Lola, what, did you think this was a play? A monologue. Sorry, Grace. Uh, stand down. Stand down. Relax. Relax. It's a monologue. What, like a one-woman show? Yeah. Oh, I see. Before and seen something better. Yes, I see that. Yeah. It's, so far, it's very loose, isn't it? It's very loose. It's not like... I can do the one that you I've seen before, I reckon. I could do one of those ones if you want. I could have a go. 
I could have a go. I'll try. Hold on, one second. No, which is apparently four of you. <laughs> I always have a co-host, and tonight I have a very special co-host, one who has travelled around Australia and New Zealand with me doing the show, one who has done so many UK tour dates with me, one who I absolutely know and love, and one who won't usually come to London because she lives up north, and why would she? She will come to Australia with me a 24-hour flight before I can get her to fucking London. But tonight... Soho, she said, if it's Soho Theatre and if it's Saturday night, I will come. <laughs> Please put your hands together and make extraordinary noises for the wonderful Leicester legend. It's the one and only Grace Petrie! <laughs> Good evening. Mm. Gosh, the, the, the north. Well, you are from the north. Where are I you am living not from the north. But you're <laughs> from the north, but you're currently living I further. I neither live nor I'm from the north. Well, where are you living at the moment? Norwich. What? Okay. That's is, not is, exactly it, the north. It is 100% in the east. The, oh, the well, local use is, is called Look East. <laughs> is it northeast though? Is it North East? I think in oh, my mind... She's just losing the UK audience bit by bit at the time. I wasn't... No? Listen, I wasn't raised here, and you told me you were moving to Sheffield. My sister-in-law lives in Sheffield, and that's... I know it's the Midlands, but it's Sheffield. north of the Watford Gap. Sheffield is in the north. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. that's... In my mind, you moved from Leicester to the north. I, you, yes, you're stopping in Norwich, but that's not my fault. Or my responsibility. I Fine. Try, Fine. I, I try and keep up with you, but you live in different places. I live in different places. I'm in the north. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm all over the place. I think, I think people I... who don't live in London live in the north or the home county. <laughs> I, 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 I believe in people who live in the home counties, and I understand there are people who live in the north. Yes. I'm sort of blindsided by the chicken monologue. Um... <laughs> Mentally, I'm still licking my fingers. <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> 
aren't we all? I, you know, but no, I just want to, because I don't, I've got nothing against London. Um, I just no, don't want I, anybody I was to just, think that I'm... I was just like, it was sort of just something to say. I hadn't planned it, much like the chicken monologue. No, no, it no. It was just something to say that sort of made you seem special. Oh, absolutely. So it was sort yeah. of like, I can't get her here, but tonight she's come for you. Yeah. You've now killed that I, I'm sorry, I idea didn't. In the I, just want, I just sort of wanted you to know, because I do live in Norwich, Yeah. I <laughs> came via fucking Peterborough to be here, guys. So... Do you know what I mean? Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. I'm, I'm really sorry. Look, I've no. toured this country so many times. I'm not good at song lyrics or geography. So if you live elsewhere and you're hearing this bit because Tom's left it in, please don't be insulted that I don't know. I mean, I know Newcastle is really close to Scotland mm. and things like that. Yeah. I've got a sense of Manchester. Yeah. I just am not... I'll be in the tour van and I'll yeah. be, like, entertaining, you know, Stuart, <laughs> our driver. And, and me. So, Monologues galore in the tour van, you know. I do quizzes yeah. for Stuart, our tour manager. Do yeah, pub quizzes do, late yeah. at night. He said most other comedians just get in the car and fall asleep, which is fair enough. But mm. I like to entertain him because I worry about, you know, it's a long, he's worked harder than us. And so I just think, you know. Nobody works harder than him. Nobody works yeah. harder than Stuart. But because, also, also, if Tom does leave this in, please don't leave in that I said fucking Peterborough either. Because you there's need to be one or two people listening in Peterborough, I think. Yeah, yeah. They, and they'll write in. Yeah, oh, yeah. People They've write got fuck in. all else to do, mate. They're in Peterborough. Do you know? <laughs> please do leave that in, Tom, because I just want to see the fallout now. I want to see. They've got nothing else to do because they live in fucking Peterborough. Yeah. If everyone doesn't tweet Grace said that tonight, I'll be very disappointed. They don't have the internet in Peterborough. <laughs> Oh, she's doubling down. Is anyone here from Peterborough? No. <laughs> of course not. Of course not. People from Peterborough don't leave. Um, <laughs> if you've ever written into the guilty feminists to complain about something, cheer now. No, they don't. I think maybe the ones who, who complain don't come. I don't know. People, people complain a lot. Most people of these people to... don't know what the show is, to be honest. They, <laughs> they were, they'll be happy. The, the show has peaked for a lot of people because they really came to see a chicken monologue and they've had it. Yeah, it's... And that's... Darling, it's peaked for me backstage. Fucking hell. I was, yeah, I was enthralled. Do you know, do you know funnily enough, a man taught me to improvise. Uh, that's so patriarchal the way I've said that, isn't mm. it? A man taught me to improvise. A woman didn't bother. That's what mm. I sounded like. No, the reason I'm saying a man, it was also a woman, um, Patty Styles, who taught me to improvise. But she was taught by Keith Johnston. And he, in the 50s, he worked at the Royal Court and then at RADA. And he wanted to improvise on stage in the 60s. And you weren't allowed to because every text that was performed on stage had to be taken to the Lord Chamberlain's office. And they had to red pen anything that they thought was not fit moral content. Or you couldn't make fun of the royal family. You couldn't... Yeah, you know, say anything that was not blasphemous. Fit moral content. Oh, that content's fit, isn't it? Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Not not that kind of fit. I not like whoa, moral content. Sorry, I see moral content. I just get horny. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that chicken monologue's really set you it's off. It's really, I, yeah. Um, I hadn't even got to the part about the Pope's nose. Um, so, is that what you call it here? <laughs> Parsons' nose, you call it here. I was raised in Australia. What the fuck is going on? Okay. <laughs> Anyway, Keith actually moved to Canada because it was illegal to perform improvisation on the stage here until 1969 because the Lord Chamberlain couldn't set the text. And Keith said, well, maybe send somebody down with a bell from the office and if we do anything you don't like, just ring the bell because he thought that would be really funny and a great impro game. Um, anyway, they said no. So he ended up moving to Canada because you could perform improvisation in theatres. And he said it was so embarrassing because he said these Soviet Union theatre companies who would come to tour, you know, to perform their great... Uh, their great art um, would sympathise with the British theatre companies and say it must be awful for you with this terrible censorship and he was like they were from behind the Iron Curtain and we were like oh my god <laughs> this is so embarrassing um, and so he moved to Canada but he wrote this very seminal book in the 70s called Impro Improvisation of the Theatre when I was in a cult I was, I've met, as many of you will know and many of you who Christian you won't know this I was <laughs> I was a Jehovah's Witness, Christian and Lola, and uh, my parents became Jehovah's Witnesses when I was 14, so I had a pretty regular childhood until I was 14, and then I didn't get out till I was in my 20s. I was over here and I had to get out, and then I got cut off and shunned by the Jehovah's Witnesses. And so in that time, it was very stultifying because I'd gone from a kid at school who was into absolutely everything, and I was acting, and I'd, I was doing debating and playing in the school band and everything that I could possibly be doing. And I was so excited to go to university, and on the evening of my baptism these two elders came and stood on my parents' driveway and said, you can't go to university um, because it's worldly and you'll commit fornication and you'll learn about evolution. Um, <laughs> In <I'd>... that order. <laughs> 
I mean, it's all part of the same, I suppose. Yeah. Survival, survival of the fittest. Whoa. Um, <laughs> anyway, there was something called Theatre Sports on the Television, which I didn't know. It was a format that Keith Johnson had invented. I went to a workshop. I wasn't meant to. I snuck off and went to a workshop. The elders didn't know. And I started getting secretly involved. I had a secret double life with the sort of Whose Lives It Anyway style mob. Um, it wasn't, no, it was no sex, drugs or rock and roll. It was literally just yes and, mm. and like games, fun games where you'd put your arms to and things like that. But it was just, you couldn't do anything wildly. And they told me to buy this book called Impro- Improvisation of the Theatre and it just changed my life. I was to sort of read it under the covers because it was all about freeing your mind. And it wasn't porn. No. <laughs> it was all about freeing your mind. And I want to talk a bit about it later but I learned to improvise secretly while a Jehovah's Witness. And uh, as soon as I left, the day I left, I found improvisation in London and learned from a woman called Patty Styles who had worked with Keith and then went to Canada to work with Keith. Um, and the reason I'm talking about this is there's no way I could do anything I do without Keith and Patty. There's no way, nothing. Every podcasting is just opening your mouth, starting a sentence boldly, assuming your brain will find some way to finish it. That's all it is. And... It was the only trauma healing I had was improvisation. Healing, sort of stopping the bleeding with Keith's book and the workshops I could sneak off and attend and the shows I could go to while a Jehovah's Witness. And then all I did after I left for years, other than go to university, was improvise, 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 because it's about trusting yourself and being in the moment and trusting your partner. The reason I'm telling you this is Keith died this week. And I had no idea that I would improvise a monologue at all. Like, why would I have done that? That's crazy. But when Lolo said it's a, I thought it was a monologue, I thought, oh, I've been to lots of shows at the Soho Theatre. I, I reckon I can do something like that. Because Keith and Patty told me to trust myself. And when I was in a cult, it was all, don't trust your heart. Uh, no independent thinking. It was all about locking yourself down. And it took a lot to open that up again. And so I just want to say, uh, Keith, you've now gone to the great moose in the sky. Um, that's where he would say, if you had a bad show, the impro gods weren't smiling, send it to the great moose in the sky. If you had a good show, celebrate the great moose in the sky. It's nothing to do with you. His company was called the loose moose. I should probably explain that. Um, and so wherever he is now, he's, I feel like he's always with us now because his energy is always with us. So that unexpected monologue that I uh, improvised tonight, I'll send the audio of it to Patty because she'll really love it. Um, uh, she happens to be over here. She lives in Australia and she happened to be over here the other day and um, uh, we just got to have lunch and sit down. So I just want to say, I want to celebrate those people because, you know, if I hadn't found out, I would have found something and I would have survived and I would have found a way to thrive. But the sliding door I went through had Keith and Patty on the other side and they held me and they showed me how they'd fixed their trauma and they paid that forward. So I just want to say, if you've got a drink, to Keith. If you haven't ever read his book, Keith Johnston's Impro, I mean, it was written in the 70s, so there are some things that may land on your ear as dated, but it is, if you read it with an open spirit around the anxiety we all carry around with us and the way we're all trying so hard to be good, then you will get so much from it. Mm -hmm. And funny enough, that is the theme tonight because our guest has a show called... Stop trying to be fantastic. Stop trying to be fantastic. And that's what Keith would always say. There's a total coincidence. It was The, the theme was chosen uh, by our guest. And she said, "It's called, my show's called Stop Trying to be Fantastic. And I went, oh my God, that's exactly what Keith would always say. He'd say, stop trying so hard to be good. And Patty would say, go out on stage to say yes and be average. Um, and uh, one time I was really struggling with impro and I said to Keith, I felt like I'd got to a place where I was good, good at it, you know, and I knew how to do it. And then something happened and I felt locked. And I said to Keith, I just, I don't know what's going on. Can you watch me? And he watched a show that I was in and he went, ah, oh, I know what's wrong. He said, it's not enough to be okay with being average or failing. He said, you've got to enjoy being bad. <laughs> oh my God, it totally changed my, I went out the next show to enjoy being bad. I'd never been better. It's the irony. We're yeah. holding all this tension. And I've been doing that my whole career and I never even met this guy. <laughs> it's just incredible, isn't it? The, the connections we have. Um, this is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and our hypocrisies and insecurities, which... Undermine them. Thank you. If you didn't know that, it's undermine them. 
And if I feel like we should let everyone else in on that now. Our hypocrisies and insecurities, which... Undermine them. Do you know, I saw Christian join in there. I really loved it. Yeah. Well done, Christian. How, what do you think of the show so far, Christian? I'm getting the whole thing. You're getting the whole thing. <laughs> Layla? Getting the whole thing. <laughs> I mean, we are no, getting the whole thing tonight. You've got no choice, Christian. Lola, Lola, is it so far better or worse than you expected? Very good. Very good. I mean, I feel you're our trust pilot, true reviewers, because other people have come in here with conceptions. They're like, I love this show, and they're just happy to be in the room with us, to be honest. They're not going to review this. They're just going to go five stars because we get to be here. You are going to be the true trust pilots, okay? Lola and Christian, you're my trust pilots. I will come back to you every now and again and just check in. Mm. But at the end, if I forget, could just, as someone remind me, Grace or someone in the front row, could you just remind me, check in to see how many stars they give it on trust pilot, Okay. Hello, Guilty Feminists. This is Deborah. We have some shows coming up. If you're in London, we will be at the Soho Theatre on the 30th of May and the 31st of May. And we will be at King's Place on the 5th of June, the 22nd of June and the 24th of July. For tickets, go to guiltyfeminist.com and click on live shows. My play, Never Have I Ever, is at Chichester Festival Theatre from the 1st to the 30th of September. Tickets are now on sale, but I'm glad to say they're going fast. So if you'd like to see it, go to CFT. Dot org dot uk and look for Never Have I Ever with the incredible Susie Wacoma, Alexandra Roach and Greg Wise and more. And on the 21st of August, there will be a special episode of The Guilty Feminist from Chichester, where hopefully we'll be talking all things Never Have I Ever. Join our Patreon to get ad-free episodes and to support the show. And if you could go to iTunes or wherever you get your podcast uh, and give any episode of The Guilty Feminist that you thought was good, five stars, we'd really appreciate that. Also, if you could tell someone you know with your face or on a WhatsApp group or on a social media platform that you enjoy The Guilty Feminist and share that with them, it really helps spread the word about the show. Thank you so much. We appreciate you listening. We appreciate you coming out live. We appreciate everything you do and supporting any of the activist or artistic causes we share with you. And now back to the podcast. Our guest today is the co-creator of Sky One's After Hours um, she is a poet, a theatre maker, and uh, an incredible all-round legend. I didn't think I'd have to do this, and she's also my girlfriend. Um, her her upcoming show. Her is upcoming called, show is coming very soon to London. <laughs> <laughs> the whole of it. <laughs> Please welcome to this stage and to the mic the incredible Molly Naylor. Wow. Well, what an introduction. Guys, I'm going to do a poem for you. How do you feel about, how do you feel about poetry? <laughs> well, that's very kind of you. Um, for those who said nothing, um, I'll explain a bit about poetry. So poetry is like comedy, um, but without the jokes. Um, it's like the sort of earnest younger sister of poetry. So I'm just going to do you a little poem, which is about this whole thing around Stop Trying to Be Fantastic, which is the name of my show. Um, and I noticed, so about 10 years ago, I noticed a lot of language on social media about, about kind of success and the way it was, it was starting to be couched in this quite like violent way. You know, there's a lot of talk about like crushing it and smashing it and like winning at life and killing it and slate. Do you know what I mean? Um, and so at the same time, I noticed there was loads of discourse as well about like self-care and self-love and like, you know, buying scented candles and like mindfully wanking yourself off in the bath and like all of this stuff. And I, it struck me that, and like with the kind of like killing it, slaying it language, it's, it was often just like someone being like, yeah, I'm fucking kicking the dick off life. But then there'd just be a picture of them like having a crumpet. <laughs> and it struck me that we're all under this pressure to be like killing it. But maybe if we weren't putting ourselves under that much pressure to be smashing it, we wouldn't need so many hundred pound scented candles. I, th I feel like maybe the answer is that we could all just sort of lower the bar and be a bit more shit. Who's with me? <laughs> so, so this is sort of my manifesto to, to bring you into my cult of averageness. Um, and it's, uh, it's called You're All Right. You're all right, you are. You're fine. You're six out of ten. You're medium cheese. 
Don't love yourself, accept yourself. Who's got time to love themselves when the floods are coming and there's a new season of succession? <laughs> you're all right, you are your yogurt and that's fine. You're not a tiramisu, but you don't have to be a tiramisu. Tiramisu for breakfast is too much. <laughs> you're all right, you are. You're not particularly inspiring, but you're relatively kind. So just buy me a lager and don't murder me. And just a normal <laughs> lager, please. Not an 8% craft beer with amazing graphic design. Just a lager like Cronenberg, like we used to think was fine. You're all right, you are, you are acceptable. And what more does anyone want? You're an apple. You're fine, you're a biro, it works. Your flowers from the SO, they're still flowers. What, you, uh, what do you have for tea tonight? Jacket potato? Yeah, good, do that. I know it's not paleo, but you don't have to do paleo. That's for Hollywood and cunts. <laughs> Going swimming, are you? Doing butterfly, are you? Don't, just do breaststroke. Stop trying to do butterfly, it's weird. <laughs> you're all right, you are, there's no shame in you. You're like... You're like when someone has a Q in Scrabble and they use it to spell queen. It's fine. You don't impress me much and I like that. I don't need to be impressed all the time. I'm 39, I've seen Stonehenge, I've seen a fish eat a duck, I've met Robin Ince, just crack on, you're fine. You're all right, you are, you're a work of art. You're not a work of art, you're a doodle of a hair or a photo taken by a mum on an iPad, but if we open our hearts, we can find you very poignant. You're all right, you are. You're occasionally funny. You're six out of ten. You're an apple, enough. A biro, enough. A yogurt, enough. A hedge, enough. Your hair's nice when you wash it. You're medium cheese. You're a jacket potato, perfectly good. Adequate coffee, 4 99 wine. Cronenberg, breaststroke, I love you. You're fine. Thank you. This is such a nice show. Can you just, I just so lovely to have you here. We're really having a nice time. Thank Please you. join us. Um, can you tell us what made you want to do this show and call it this title? Yes. Well, I just, I'd been talking to a lot of people and I've re I felt like there was a lot of people experiencing the same thing, which was this pressure to kind of be amazing and winning at life and all of that stuff. Um, but also I started doing research into um, the kind of, I was looking at like Buddhism and Stoicism and I was looking at like the strategies that we use to escape from our pain and discovering that like often the strategies that we use become our personalities and that is something that I have as a like so the show is about like my entire 30s and it goes through those strategies of like people pleasing and trying to be fantastic in a variety of ways and altruism trying to like give everything and workaholism so all of these different strategies and kind of unpicking them to kind of accept that the trauma that we've all faced at some point is eventually going to catch up with you and to try and just like feel that pain and have a look at it rather than running away from it. So it's all about that kind of stuff, all sort of under the umbrella of just trying to be a bit more fucking, oh, do you know what? Just have a sit down and a bit of a sandwich. Mm. That's my show. <laughs> we all just sit down, have a bit, a bit of a sandwich. sandwich. How, I, I mean, the reason I started this show was really that I felt... I desperately wanted to be part of the new feminist movement that was happening in the mid, you know, point of last decade in around 2015. Um, but I knew, and all that blah 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 <laughs> blah blah blah. But I felt like I don't know if I'm good enough, and I felt this pressure like feminism had become one more thing to be excellent at, mm. and that there's always this pressure for women to be excellent. Um, I did an event for International Women's Day and it was for women who were in the um, uh, building industry, like you know, built, literally going onto building sites and stuff. And most of the room were women. There were a couple of men. And I said, I was asking them about their experiences and they were all saying, yeah, you know, the first time I went on a building site, I was just like, I am my overalls and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And they all talked about their strategies for fitting in and you know, the things that have been difficult and the ways that they'd, they've all had different strategies and some of them the same and some successful and some not. They all related to going off and crying. And then I just said to one of the men, like, because he was, works in the office and then he goes down to the building site sometimes. And I said, you know, is this something that you relate to because you're in the office and they might think, oh, you're a pen pusher. And, and he went, no. And I said, so when do you go down to the building site? Do you, you're not trying hard to fit in or anything? And he went, no, I just rock up and do what I want. Mm. And every woman went, well, you're not trying at all. And he went, no. And he went, have you ever tried? And he went, I can't remember it. And then I, so I said to another man, do you try hard to fit in or do you, do you have to feel you have to prove yourself, you know, in, a, in, a, in this gig because there's lots of guys going, Bleh. and he went, 
um, uh, he was trying so hard, poor guy, to think of a moment <laughs> where everything hadn't been as easy as possible for camaraderie to encourage us. Yeah. He couldn't. He couldn't. No. And it's like, I, so I do think sometimes the pressure on women, especially in male-dominated environments, to be excellent, to prove that we are allowed a seat at the table or whatever, plus then be good at feminism all the time. And also, and then there's the sort of, and have you done your self-care? Have you done your self-care? Have you done self-care this week? I feel like I need self-care to get over the feeling that I should be doing self-care. Yeah, 100%. And I feel like it, it's this irony, isn't it, that we, I feel like we see our friends and we mm. want to tell them we're doing well. And especially like, you know, in the arts and we want to be like, oh, I've achieved this and I've done this and I've done this. And actually it makes, it alienates people. It makes people feel worse. What people want to hear about is your fuck-ups and your mistakes and, your, and the things that you've learned from those. And yet we feel too vulnerable, I think, to share those a lot of the time. We're too busy being like, here's what I've done. Mm. I'm nailing it. And it's like, I'm fucking not. I mean, to be fair, your name is Molly Naylor. I know, that is hard I don't, I don't for think me. It, I don't think that, it, your name doesn't encourage anybody else to get out of bed. We just think she's really nailing it. She's the nailer. I was going to do a podcast called Not Nailing It, but spelt with Y. And it was about failure. But then Elizabeth Day did one called How to Fail, which I found really annoying. It's annoying when someone does your idea better Mm. um, and actually does it rather than just talk about it in the pub. Yeah. (laughs) No, her her podcast is absolutely huge now. She has super, super famous people on. But it is interesting. I listen to a lot because I I love hearing somebody that you think, oh my God, they've got this, you know, they won the Booker Prize. But then they go, yeah, but I failed GCSE maths. And everyone said I wouldn't amount to anything. And then my first job, I got fired. And you think, oh, thank God. I mean, things have normally turned around for them by the time they're 22, to be honest. But <laughs> And then they just yeah, go on to win then book, book a prize after book a prize. But still, it's just nice to hear that they sucked at least once. And it would three times, because that's their show. Do you, how do you feel about all of this, Grace? Do you, are you relating to this? No, I'm very successful. <laughs> No, I do. Absolutely. Yeah. Big time. And, uh, and I think, well, I think it's a lovely, uh, what I like is that the show is called Stop Trying to Be Fantastic, but then it is actually a really fantastic show. Um, Oops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but that's what Keith says. Keith says when you try, who I referred to earlier, I don't know if you heard that part. Yeah. Um, but Keith and Patty would always say, if you, trying your best is not your best strategy. And when you're doing improvisation, if you come out on the stage and think this has to be good, the censorship will kick in and that is this good enough is this good enough is this good enough and you yeah. don't trust what's your first idea you don't trust your obvious and you're not just in the moment mm. so actually your best shot is trying less hard sometimes but it's really difficult for us to combat years of training you know of training and also like late capitalism because like obviously we're in this society so there's this thing called the hedonic treadmill you've probably heard of it where it's like you achieve one thing and you think oh i'll be really happy once i've like got that promotion or whatever it is i don't understand jobs but i assume <laughs> promotions are involved so you get something and then it's like but it but it won't it won't make you happy because we're designed to be like want the next thing and the next thing and the next thing so it's mm. i'm trying to like undo that and, and and i suppose that's why people do like gratitude journals and things mm. but then they're like a hundred pounds in a posh shop like you were saying so actually, a posh shop that's that's quite like a fun mum thing to say wasn't it posh a posh shop, shop. Posh shop. it's because uh, we live in the north <laughs> <laughs> A posh shop like M&S. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think we underestimate the tensions we're carrying in the 21st century. We talk a lot. It's, all, it's like a cliche to talk about social media and oh, it makes you prefer. But constantly, we're constantly seeing, if we're on our phones as much as I think we are, or as much as I hope everyone else is, because I am, <laughs> I'm really concerned for our brains because it's not just, oh, she's had a nicer holiday or she's won a BAFTA. It's not just that. It's all of the news and everyone's, every single person's take on every single story. And I think it's just tensing our bodies to such an extent and our clouding our brains to such an extent. And the expectation of, the ambition now everyone lives with. Like I think in my parents' generation, there was just a a much lower expectation of what would be achieved. And if, if if you had a family and fed them, that was the goal. It yeah, wasn't that was a enough. thing. Like you talk about, you know, you don't understand jobs because you're a poet. There's only really one promotion for a poet, isn't there? And that's laureate. <laughs> so it's, yeah. you go from nothing, same, 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 and then laureate. But that, well, I think, no, first it's you know it. <laughs> <laughs> you're a poet, you know, you know it. it. <laughs> laureate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, but it's, yeah. So it's like, Poet Nomad Laureate. Poet Nomad Laureate. And that's, and that's what I'm going for. I think I'm... Well, where are you at the I'm moment? I'm still you a poet. Be, no, you definitely know it. Do you want to make a show? We've okay, next up, Laureate. If your book is published, you know it. Okay. I think. So we need a campaign now to get me to Laureate. What's... Who's... Why, how long Simon Armitage got left? <laughs> how long to live? Get? To live, yeah. To li- is it a job is for it, life? No. Is it like being the king? I don't know. Oh, it might... No, because didn't someone... Stop? It's a, a decade. decade. Fuck like, me. It's um, a decade, yeah. Thank you. I think the next one's going to be Lem Cisse. That's fair. I think that's not, really more than not fair. Not Molnay? <laughs> Sweet uh, Molnay. Lem to say Molnay. No, I think that I think that's gonna be the next one. But listen, I hope you are poet laureate. Thank you. But um, this is the thing, it's like I but, don't need to be it's okay. I've got a nice life. But like ambition is so prized, isn't it, in our mm. culture to be like, well, what's next? What's Do next? You know who did have this figured out though? Who? Billy Joel. <laughs> don't go changing yes. to be poet laureate. <laughs> you know? You know? Um I actually I, can I t- just tell you yeah. about Simon Armitage quickly? Yeah. Because I actually have some personal beef with him. So I, my first ever poetry, proper poetry gig, I, I was like kind of supporting him. My friend runs a bookshop and he like put me on in front of him for 10 minutes, right? And then that same friend published a little pamphlet of my poems. Very exciting. And um, he gave one to Simon Armitage, hoping that Simon would be like, oh, I'll do something with this. Um, and... And then Simon Armitage just couldn't remember me. And my friend was like, you know, remember Molly? Remember you did this thing? And he was like, oh, yes, the bubbly blonde. Oh. Right, so obviously I was fuming and I just hated him for years, told everyone that story, slagged him off around the whole of um, the North. And, <laughs> and then so I, saw, I saw my friend recently and like brought this up with him again for a bit of banter. And he, he was like, oh, no, I just made that up to wind you up. Didn't happen. So I know, I know this is an emotional journey for you all. Simon Armitage is a good man, but, you, you know, so if you please so if you, correct this. if there are rumours all around Poetry Town yeah. that Simon Armitage is a massive sexist, yeah. it's because your friend made it up and then you spread that... I spread the fuck out of it, rumor. yeah. Simon Armitage, if you're listening, we can only apologise. I'm really sorry. I would love you to go on Elizabeth Day's How to Fail and say my biggest failure was slandering the good name of Simon Armitage. Yeah. And then have her have Simon Armitage come out from behind the curtain. Let's make it happen. Um, yeah. <laughs> what are our suggestions for being less fantastic? Like, how can we take the pressure off? Because I think the three of us mm. and, and examples of people who, for whom, like we're sitting here saying this, but I, I don't know about you, actually, Molly. I know that Grace and I, I know Grace well, and I feel, is that okay to say I know you well? I think I do. You know me very well. Okay. What are you going to fucking say first? <laughs> I think you, to see where this is going. I think you and I try hard, are ambitious, and uh, and I say that not in a bad way, not because I feel like a woman saying she's ambitious, it's like ah, I knew it. She's ambitious. She wants something. Where if a man is ambitious, it's good. He should because he's got mouths to feed. He doesn't. He's he's a comedian. He just goes from town to town with no responsibilities, probably. Why is it okay for him to be ambitious and not me? But I don't think I'm ambitious in a bad way. I'm apologising. I've said I'm ambitious, I'm embarrassed. But I want things to change and I want me to be there when they change. But I think and that's... I'm excited for it. But how do I not kill myself in the process? I think that's okay. I think it's just separating your worth from those achievements. Oh, no, that's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the irony. It's like doing this job, I think, always does come from a place of damage. Like, you guys are probably fine. You're just having a nice Saturday evening. Like, this is, our, this is what we've chosen to do because we need this. It does come from a place of damage. And so we have therapy and we sort it out. But then we get to this point, we're like, well, it is my job now and I'm 40. So I have to just crack on and try and, and I don't know. I, I mean, it's a, it's a nicer job than some, though, in some ways. I'll tell you what, it's a nicer job when you're doing it. The travelling you have to do to do it, like touring and things Hashtag like that. Hashtag Peterborough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're going to have to leave Peterborough in now because it's a running gag and you are going to get emails and do not send them to me because oh. I didn't say anything mean about Peterborough at all and if I did, Tom, edit it out. I don't think not touring Peterborough is going to be the end of my career. <laughs> you're not welcome. You'll be run out of time. Who here? Can everyone just close their eyes so no one can see anyone else? If you think... You are, and by damaged, traumatised. Uh, like, don't don't take that the wrong way. But if you think you understand what Molly means by damaged and you think you're damaged, go, hmm? If you think that something to do with your job, career, or how you define yourself in that way is in fact attached to your worth, say, hmm? 
Mm, interesting. More mm. people think that their career is their worth in some way than, than are damaged. Interesting. Um, if you would like to put less worth into your career and more just into your human, your breathing, you're getting out of bed without crying it's almost, you know, half the week, whatever. If you'd like to just breathe and be and for that to be enough and for that to be your self-worth, along with kindness, go, mm. If you think that could happen, go, mm. Hardly anyone. Right, okay. But I think if you went to see a show that was on in London at 2 North Down on the 25th of May called Stop Trying to Be... You might find out, you know. You never know. I don't know. Just saying. You're already doing the show once in London? Yes, once in London. Three times in Plymouth, though. So get yourselves down there. A bit of a Plymouth. Are you from... (laughs) (laughs) Just like Plymouth. Lovely. And once in Norwich, which is... Good. Okay, so we're Plymouth, Norwich over here. Plymouth Fascinating. Nor- uh, okay, uh, so if you'd like to go to Plymouth and Norwich, Molly Naylor will be there. Um, Molly, yeah. do you have another poem for us? Uh, yes. I do but want also, if that- you're going to be in London, <laughs> I feel like that's more convenient for most of us, right? <laughs> but when, is, when is London? Um, I think it's the 25th of May. You, you need to know that. I do that's, know that's, that. I should have looked before. Th- Grace, will, Grace will look it up. I'll look it up. You should have been more fantastic about knowing your date in London because <laughs> these people will come if you tell them where it is. Yeah. If you build it, they will come, they will but come. only if they know where it is. <laughs> Can't just build it and then just be like, even with the, that field of dreams, he probably advertised it, didn't he? Probably put it on Facebook. Molly Naylor's Stop Trying to Be Fantastic is at uh, 2 North Down on the 22nd of May. <laughs> How you are they, way off. How can they book tickets? Uh, on the internet that they don't... <laughs> but where? It's a big don't place. Have in it's a big place. Um, there's, a, there's a link. There'll be a link on Molly's website. Uh, what's Molly's website? Mollynaylor.com. Should you say yes, this bit? Yes, .com. Mollynaylor.com. Yeah. N-A-Y-L-O-R. Like, yeah. Naylor, I don't even know her. <laughs> I hardly know her. That's it. It's hardly know her. I'll do it again. <laughs> Naylor, I hardly know her. <laughs> I don't even also, know her. Sh- also, she's... Grace's girlfriend, so it'll be awkward. I don't That's... know. We've been together three years nearly, so... <laughs> Shall you know. I leave you guys to it? <laughs> yeah. Molly's going to do another poem now. Yes, I am. Um, so... And then are we going to do Who's Jizz? Oh, oh yes, yeah, yeah, we yeah. need to do Who's Jizz. Um, so, oh, God, this is, so it's a, a, I think it's a poem about therapy. How do you do? Is anyone having therapy? <laughs> well, that's very good. Um, so I feel like when I was a... In my 20s, I would date people and the date would go like this. It would go like, hello, I'm Molly and I'm perfect. And they'd go, hello, I'm whoever and I'm perfect. And then we'd spend the the next like few hours or months or years disappointing each other. So now I open with my baggage and I open with my pain and my trauma. And like that, you know, you could say that isn't a good idea, but I've snagged this one. So, you know, (laughs) this one. What what am I, like a man from the 90s? Awful. Um, So this is about that. It's called, Exhausted by my brilliant solitude, I consider introducing someone to my body and my ghost. That was a working title, and then I just ran out of time. It's still working. They don't recommend getting your ghost out for the lads. Not at this age. Ghosts are for fantasists. Kids, cannabis confessions parked up by the reservoir in older boys' cars. Adult-sized people want to watch long-form TV with those who don't look haunted at all. But I'm friends with my ghost. We have found a rhythm. She has a certain dystopian charm and she's generous with her cigarettes. And what if this time I found someone whose ghost gets on with mine? Our ghosts could drink or fuck while we were free to roam. Adventures would be easy and we would fall asleep anywhere as we'd both know what's hiding in the dark. Thank you. Someone went like this, mm, which is the um, best reaction to a poem that you can have. Who's Jizz, though? Who's Jizz? So Sorry, here's... that was a beautiful poem. Now Thanks. tell me, whose Jizz is it anyway? So I'm a feminist, but I spent last weekend in a hot tub in Margate inventing this game, Who's Jizz? Where, thank you, Margate. Didn't get much, which I like, because I don't really respect Margate and people who choose to move there. It's just hackney, isn't it, with the nice sea? Oh, um, no. Apologies. No, loads of my um, friends live in Margate now. I know, but that's probably because they were cool London guys, and then they got tired and now that is the truth. When isn't a man it? is tired of London, he goes to Margate. <laughs> he goes to Margate. <laughs> I, I, I like Margate and all who sail in her. No, it so is I'm lovely. going to defend Margate, but continue on. Okay, so we're in this hot tub, and, we, and my friend invented this game called Who's Jizz, where you have to just decide, and everyone has to do it. Like, who, if you had to make a baby with a celebrity man's jizz, 
who would you pick? Now, it sounds like an easy game. It's really hard to win at this game because everyone's suggestions are terrible. So m- one of my friends came up with Monty Don. <laughs> The gardener. The gardener. Um, I think she, that's who my mum would she, pick. Yeah, exactly. And then, um, and then someone else like was banging on about this celebrity like Instagram vet, and I panicked and shouted Barack Obama, <laughs> which was apparently a, a, a terrible choice. And then I brought it home to Grace, and she chose this is disgusting Daniel Radcliffe. <laughs> Listen, I all right, I, I, I panicked <laughs> and I just, I just listened to him on Desert Island Discs and he sounded like a really nice guy. So, Daniel Radcliffe. Daniel Radcliffe. You're Harry Potter's babies. His missus is super well, pregnant. So well, it's powerful too. His jizz. His jizz. She's she, super pregnant. She, she played that game and won. You said it was yeah, difficult to win, won. but she played it and won. So let's see someone else. I want someone else to lose though. Christian, okay. where... <laughs> Chris, Christian, I think Christian probably. I, I'm not. I want, I'm going to go out on a large limb and say Christian's not looking to get pregnant. He's got his own jizz. I think he comes. Uh, he, his, body, his body produces its own. I think. That's but fair I don't enough. Know this, like, I feel, uh, like the Virgin Mary. Oh God, I'm sorry, Christian. You've not come here for this. I'm so sorry. I feel. I'm so sorry, Lola. Let's play with you. Mm. Uh, Lola, who's jizz? No, oh, she's <laughs> ripped. <laughs> Of course. She had her answer ready. Oh, of course. Who would you pick, Deb? I, John Hamm, but I, obviously. Of but I, I, do I get to... Jizz Ham. Do I get to have it? The, the, Collect the, the jizz. The, yeah, do I get to have no, it? No, 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 no. You don't get sex. You just get the jizz. In, in a vial. Yeah. <laughs> Did you know that, Lola, when you answered? It, it's <laughs> it's, it's going to be delivered by courier, Lola, and you yeah. have to turkey baste it in. Um, <laughs> anyone else got a suggestion they think will top Trump's that? Yes, Dermot O'Leary. Dermot O'Leary. <laughs> Dermot O'Leary. I can see that. I think he'd be a good dad. Yes. <laughs> David Tennant. David Tennant. David Tennant. Oh. <laughs> hey. Who? David Gandhi. David Gandhi. Yeah, oh, the model. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Good, good idea. Yes. Jamie from Outlander. Yeah. <laughs> Is that a f- not a fictional character? <laughs> oh, the actor. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm convinced now. <laughs> uh, the actor. You need to read it and see it to believe it, and then you need to... I still don't think that's going to work around the fictional jizz part, if I read it, but anyway. Then you need to collect the semen and inseminate yourself (laughs) to get the full... If you're a real fan, if you're a real fan. Anybody, any more for any more? Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking, that actually... Very, very intellectual. Very intellectual. Lovely Um, Lovely jizz. He is in a very... I think, I'm so sorry to break this to you, we think he's... Dead. He's got He's some cheese knocking about, frozen somewhere. Do you, do you? I do think so. Do you? Yeah, I think we could. Hmm? He's dead. Yeah, no, he did. He's oh, dead. Oh, Mike. He's not dead. Yeah, no, I'm so sorry. He's 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 ill and it's not looking good. Um, I don't want to upset you live on stage, but yeah, he's not. He's not I well. I just didn't hear about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Well, listen. Please enjoy that in the privacy of your own home. Um, enjoy that game. It's an insane it's a note to end on, isn't it? It's a well, Christmas game, isn't it? Good yeah. trip around the table. With your nan? Yeah, lovely. Lovely stuff. Could we change it to like, who who would impregnate you anywhere or something? Because the word jizz I find off-putting. What do you like? What word do you use? What the, word do I use? For jizz. I would never mention it. <laughs> <laughs> I would literally never mention it. No, it would never come up. I, I would... <laughs> if, if I well, had, if I had to that say that solves it, the problem in itself, doesn't it? If I had to say it, I would say fluid. <laughs> fluid. <laughs> That's semen. horny. Bodily fluid. S- semen, I think, is quite a sophisticated word. Semen. <laughs> spermatozoa. That's lovely, actually. That's poetic. I think I'm going to put that I in think a poem. Spermatozoa is only one, though, isn't it? Is it one spermatozoa? Oh. More two sperm. Um, <laughs> I'm going to read, because I just wanted to, just so there's something on theme for the podcast. I, I came up with reasons to stop trying hard to be perfect. A perfect person has never led a revolution. Anyone trying to create a perfect piece of art creates a mediocre derivative one or an outlandish one trying hard to be clever or interesting 
rather than something from the heart and soul of a flawed human being that will speak to other human beings. The closer you get to someone else's idea of perfection, the more frustrated you get that you can't get all the way there, and ironically, the more inadequate you feel. How can I be so close and yet still fall so short? The perfection seeker thinks. The perfection quester can only see the 20% still missing and berates herself and hates her own work. The action and change quester sees the 80% that's there now where nothing stood before. As Sondheim wrote in Sunday in the Park with George about the work of a painter, studying the hat, entering the world of the hat, reaching through the world of the hat like a window, back to this one from that, starting on a hat, finishing a hat, Look, I made a hat where there never was a hat. There are no perfect hats in art, in life, in feminism, in activism, in representation. But there are our hats where there never were our hats before. Uh, the teacher and director who taught me this, Keith Johnston, who died this week, said as a child he questioned everything his teachers did and noticed that they only rewarded children who looked like they were trying hard. If you looked relaxed and you were just thinking and enjoying your thought process, they would say, you, you're not even trying. But if you screwed up your face and looked hard at your paper like you were trying, and it was very difficult for you, they would come around and do it for you. So we have learnt to look as if we are trying hard, to perform trying for perfection. And it's only when we relax our shoulders and breathe and be and just have a go at making a hat that we have any chance at all of success or happiness. Thank you very much. Grace Petrie. Deborah Francis White. People haven't come all this way out here to not hear you sing. Oh gosh, is that true? Would you, would you close our show, which has run over, with a song? I'd love to do a song. Yeah, I'm going to go over here for it. Grace Petrie, everybody! That should be good. Thank you very much. Oh gosh, I'm so fucking close to you guys, aren't I? What? <laughs> This is going to be bloody intimate, isn't it? Bloody. Um, maybe I'll come back a little bit. Um, um, yeah, well, listen, um, I, what I can say about perfectionism is that uh, I spend a lot of time feeling very unqualified for this job. Um, I can't read music um, and I never studied. Uh, I never went to university. I never did a music degree or anything like that. So I, I spent uh, 15 years working in, in music and... Uh, quite a lot of the time I feel like I don't really know what I'm doing um, but what I learned um, about 10 years ago is that um, fucking everybody feels like that whatever job they're doing right so I wrote this song um, and it's called Nobody Knows That I'm a Fraud um, give me a shout if you've ever suffered from imposter syndrome yes and then there are one or two liars in as well aren't there bloke so I think we all have anyway this is a uh, called Nobody Needs Something Fraud Against This. I don't watch PMQs as often as you might expect. I only live tweet question time for comedic effect. I've never read Virginia Woolf or any Bertolt Brecht. And nobody knows that I'm a fraud It's often been alleged that I'm as hard left as can be But my idea of edgy is an unknown brand of tea And I'm not even veggie, let alone dairy-free Nobody knows that I'm a fraud But I'll get up underneath the lights until I feel adored but I'll never tell you anything that I think you won't applaud Oh, it might not always be the truth, but it'll have three chords Nobody knows that I'm a fraud Nobody knows that I'm a fraud Well, dressing how I do, I find I often get mistook 
By graphic novel fans who judge me on the way I look But I just like Batman shirts, I've never read a comic book Nobody knows that I'm a fraud When people call me a musician, it makes my palms perspire I took grade one piano and I never got no higher and if I didn't have this capo, then you'd all see I'm a liar. Nobody knows that I'm a fool. But I'll get up underneath the lights until I feel adored. And I'll never tell you anything that I think you won't applaud. Oh, it might not always be the truth, but it'll have three chords. Nobody knows that I'm a fraud. Nobody knows that I'm a fraud. So scared that we're losing And some days I'm just so sure we'll never win And some days I get so knackered from refusing To let that in, to let that in Whoa Well some days life feels like a play that you have not rehearsed but one thing's true of all of us sharing this universe Is that we could all be doing better And we could all be doing worse And everyone you know feels like a fool Come on and get up underneath the lights until you feel adored But never tell them anything you think they won't applaud Oh, it might not always be the truth But it'll have three chords Nobody knows that I'm a fraud Oh, it might not always be the truth But it'll have three chords And I guess I'll take up spoken words I wrote this song before we were together <laughs> When I run out, of course Cos nobody knows that I'm a fraud Grace Petrie! Uh, Christian, Lola, how many stars on Trust Polo? Gosh. There's only one answer there, isn't there? There's only one answer, a really quick answer. Nobody, nobody wants to hear that, Christian. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to hear that. Five. Ha thank you. If everybody else could go onto iTunes and leave us five stars uh, because Christian's going to bring our average down, that would really help. <laughs> you can leave it for any episode. You can leave it for any episode. So just go on there and leave us five stars or maybe go online and tell, or tell someone with your face about the show. That'd be really lovely. Uh, Christian, uh, uh, you said that you were going to decide if you're a feminist based on tonight. What do you think? You think so? You think so? <laughs> you Listen, you're not gang. Only four and a half starts for the patriarchy, but we've won him over. Come on. All I have to say, Christian, is um, my father <laughs> sat at the table choking on the bone. I think it was the wing. It had slid around, you see. He was arguing with my mother. And it just got stuck. Not one of us helped him. We just sat and stared into his green eyes as they bulged almost out of his face. Mother, I said. Don't, she said. I didn't. She wouldn't. By the time the ambulance came, there was very little of him left. No breath in his face, no life in the eyes. Just a swollen tongue. It seemed fitting. At his funeral, a second wife on the right, a mistress on the left, 14 half-brothers and sisters that I had never met, 13 of them 
I've never seen again. One lies here at my feet in this coffin tonight. Now may I lick you. Special guest Molly Naylor. The recording engineer was Grundy Lizimbra. The Guilty Feminist theme tune was by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Zelinsky for the Spom Data Shop. Thanks to Rachel Craft, Jim Dacio, Zainab Muhammad, and everyone at Soho Theatre, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Tom, where is Tom? This happened last night. Sorry. This is another monologue. There is no Tom. (laughs) Tom, my clipboard's not here. Are you there? Because my clipboard's not here. What do you you want to know? I could probably improvise the opening title. Let's let's improvise them, sure. Okay, all right. This is, let me give it, let me give it a go. All right. It's called The Guilty Feminist. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) All right. I'll do the bit I know. This is the explanation of the show if you don't know it. This is The Guilty Feminist. The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.